For decades now, party games have been an ever-present part of the gaming industry. I am almost certain everyone who clicked on this video has played at least one of them at some point in their life. From your Mario Party to your Jackboxes, it's easy to see what's so conceptually appealing about them, for both companies and consumers alike. Having a game that can be enjoyed by multiple people at once with a lot of replayability is a really easy sell, right? Especially when you slap a recognizable name on it. Not to mention, that replayability often doesn't come from a massive amount of content that needs to be created, but the interactions that come from the small amount of it. Please, just, dude! <laughs> what is your- <laughs> It's a competition! No, it's not! Why you gotta air it? It's a friendly game! It's called a party game! It's just Nick You got a party, you punch someone in the face? Yes. However, with that being said, it's also one of the most shovelware genres out there, due in part to those very same reasons. When you look at most party games, they come in a few typical flavors, ranging from adaptions of game shows or tabletop games. But the most popular ones, by far, you will find, is the Mario Party formula. That's not to imply Mario invented either concept of video game board games or minigames, but the way it melds them together was uniquely its own. And ever since the release of that first game, companies have been following its success, despite games in that category very rarely reaching the peaks in quality Mario Party has held. Although, if we look at the developers themselves, they have struggled to hit the mark, even during their heyday. For instance, many people write off Sonic Shuffle as a bad attempt at a Mario Party clone. And sure, I wouldn't disagree with that. But it's important to keep in mind, it was made by Hudson Soft. It's not as if some low-tier developer went out trying to copy Mario Party. It's the ones responsible for it. So if the creators of some of the best this genre has to offer can struggle, it really is no surprise then that a cheap and effective method has been the norm for these types of games. As a result, I don't think it would be unfair to say, despite its numerous entries in the genre, it's potentially one of the least explored out there. Now, let's take another look at Nintendo. A more recent example would be Amiibo Festival, an Animal Crossing board-based party game. At a glance, it takes much from Mario Party, but it really doesn't do anything with it, other than slapping on that fresh coat of Animal Crossing paint. If you want it, you could very easily replace the aesthetics on offer here, and the game could be from any franchise. Do keep in mind though, it's not that I'm saying that's always a bad thing. There are better outings of this. Not every party game feels like just a cheap ripoff for some cash. Mario Party itself, other than aesthetics, doesn't exactly scream Mario mechanically. It's just both the blueprint as well as a good execution of the formula. The fact that the original team moved on after the 8th main entry to make the Wii Party series is indicative of that, where the formula is on full display without any series dressing. Which is going to lead us to why Ape Escape Pumped and Primed is one of my favorite party games. Admittedly, while Pumped and Prime might not be my usual choice for something to play with friends, it is certainly one of the more unique. It isn't something that could have Ape Escape easily slotted out for another series. In some ways, it's the reversal of what I typically see the mindset for these types of games aping Mario Party to be. Instead of how do we take this established party formula and plaster our brand name on it, it's how do we turn the Ape Escape formula itself into a party game. It feels like something very much for the fans, and specifically designed for the series in mind. This is something you feel the second you turn on the game. While there is a normal opening, you can also be treated to this Pippo Monkey live action segment as the first thing you see. In fact, it's the montage I opened this video with. It's completely unnecessary, but it just feels like something fun the team did, and that's going to be a recurring theme here. You can feel the people who made this game both have a real love for the series and had enjoyed their time making it. But that's enough build up. Let's talk structure. The main story of the game takes place after Ape Escape 2, with Spike and the Ape Escape 1 cast entering a virtual reality tournament, you know, for fun, but as these things usually go, it doesn't last that way for long. So with that setup, the game has you participate in multiple rounds consisting of four challenges each. This is the equivalent of the game's minigames. Off the bat, what I enjoy about these is in party games. The minigames themselves often have a very generic feel to them. Again, it's simply aesthetics. You can make any character drink a soda or knock each other off of an iceberg. On the contrary, with Pumped and Primed, these minigames feel as though they're just an extension of the mainline series, the gadget training rooms in particular. Much like those, you're given one gadget or vehicle for each event, allowing you to become more accustomed to it before you can mix and match your whole arsenal. 
The main difference is, in the early events, your goal isn't to just get to the end of a course, like in the training rooms, but usually there's a secondary goal attached to it, as you're competing with other players to use the given gadget most effectively, whether it's collecting more coins than your opponent on a course or being the last man standing. However, once you do get to those events that allow you to use your whole arsenal, the game takes on a dynamic that's much closer to the Jake races from Ape Escape 1. Now it becomes who can get to the goal using all of your chosen equipment at your disposal for the races. And with the Battle Royale style rounds, the arenas become much more expansive, having multiple areas where each gadget's strengths can be taken advantage of. The only modes that don't really change are the vehicle sections. Their courses also get more expansive for the most part, and add hazards, but generally they remain the same otherwise. Even the control itself and how you move, use gadgets, everything, feels and plays near identical to the controls you've already become accustomed to in the mainline series. The biggest change in their use is now you can combine gadgets once you charge up a special meter. These attacks typically fuse properties of both equipment, but some also lead to unique specials based on the character, or it can even summon a partner to briefly fight alongside you. Oh wait, is this the one I think it is? Let's go, boys! Get him! <laughs> Why do you remember that? <laughs> the point being, this is still all distinctly Ape Escape. It's not a matter of aesthetics alone, but the gameplay. And in addition to all that, you can take on this entire campaign with a second player, making it effectively a mix of co-op while still being competitive as you experience the story. It really does go back and forth between the two. As I said earlier, the tournament doesn't stay just for fun for very long. Throughout the campaign, you have boss battles that occur disrupting the main event, with the characters teaming up to take down these threats in the story. You as players do this as well. The last third of the game even becomes strictly co-op, as after one of the two players wins the tournament, the big bad reveals himself and once again, it's up to the both of you now to put a stop to it. Which is one of the more unique aspects. There aren't many games I've seen that put you in a co-op or competitive environment and then flip it as you're progressing through a story, but the few times it has happened, such as with this game, or to name another example, in reverse, the ending level in the third episode of LEGO Star Wars, it has always been a treat. Not that these are particularly immersive games, mind you, but for me, the sudden switch up of the dynamic was something that initially caught me off guard and strengthened the experience. If there was any detail I would criticize about the game, it's that in order to move on to other rounds, one player has to achieve a certain point threshold. Not meeting it means you have to do the entire series again, which can become troublesome if you're constantly swapping wins with the other human player as the threshold gets higher. For me, there is always one point toward the end of a playthrough where this ends up happening, and it's about the only time the game stops feeling fun. You already received prizes for playing well, so I think this cap should have been removed when having a second player, just requiring one of the two to take first place. But let's talk about those prizes, as they're a big part of what this game does well. I did say one of the most appealing characteristics of party games is their replayability. However, with Pumped and Primed, that was one of the biggest criticisms levied toward the game, that it lacked that. I do think that's a fair observation to say it's lacking the replayability one's used to from a party game, and it can be something you don't personally like, but I'm not sure saying it lacks replayability in general is a fair criticism. The game is just going for something different. The replayability is still there, but it comes from unlocking those prizes, as opposed to giving you a simple gameplay loop with heavy RNG elements to keep you coming back for those interactions it creates. Moments like that still exist, mind you, we've had snippets of them throughout this video, but the RNG of it all is to a lesser degree. There's a much higher skill factor here, thus you are working to master those games and collect the prizes on offer. For each of the stages, you're given an extra task, whether it's finishing in a certain amount of time or racking up a certain high score. If you achieve this, you will get a monkey ID card, fan mail, and finally, a present. This is one of my favorite parts of the game. Seeing all these monkey variants from past centuries is a nice touch on its own, but the letters they come with are where it really shines. When doing my co-op playthrough for this video, we got some genuine reactions out of these. Uh, everyone has regrets in the past. Panzer, I was wrong. I wish I could start all over again. It's got nothing to do with you. Sorry. What the fuck? Some of these are really fucking like... <laughs>
actual like, are you, is this monkey okay? What's going on? Some fan mail can be as simple as a child's mother, writing you a letter attached with a picture their kid drew, saying how cool they thought you were in the tournament, because their child's too young to write it herself, all the way to a monkey debating philosophy, life, or questioning the government. They just ooze the personality that the series is known for. Some of these letters even go so far as to have lore between them. We've always had this little flavor text with the monkey radar, to give what would be otherwise normal collectibles personality. This translates over here perfectly, expanding on the concept. But of course, this is just flavor. If you do well enough, these monkeys send you gifts as well, which can be more gadgets for a character, that have varying elemental properties or different stats to the base ones. Extra summons, allowing those fans themselves to join the battle with you. Costumes to personalize your character. And lastly, there are videos, which we will get to later. There is a lot to do here in terms of unlocks and the progression system, but that's the thing. Usually with party games, there's not a lot of either of those. It's about that simple gameplay loop we went over earlier. Which I'm not saying this is inherently better, it's different, and I really like this experience as something different. In some ways, it also allows you to double down on that co-op aspect, by working together to get unlockables. And as a kid, I remember doing this quite a lot. While the game does have a traditional versus mode, where you can play with up to four players, as well as customize your own tournament brackets. Most of my experience, even with friends in the game, is within the story mode, as again, that's where you're going to be getting those prizes. In fact, one of the other features that makes this more appealing is you aren't necessarily unlocking those gifts for, say, Spike, as an example. What you do is you pick a character as a base, give them a nickname, and that is essentially your avatar. That's where those unlocks go. This is saved separately to your save file, so as long as you had your memory card with you, you could bring your characters anywhere, whether it was to a friend's house or maybe you just wanted to do a fresh playthrough. This was really enjoyable when I was young, as while it was still always fun to work on a friend's save for a game, the ability to work on effectively both of ours at the same time was really cool. And even now, because of the way emulation and netplay factors into this, as well as the state of the world, me and a friend were able to play on our files separately, then when we wanted to do a playthrough together, using both of our own characters, we could. Obviously, this kind of a feature is far more common nowadays, with a lot of games allowing you to progress alone before coming together, but back then, it was more of a novelty. Now, the last bit I want to bring attention to is the intermission movies. When getting to certain sections of the main story, depending on who you win with, you will get cutscenes tailored to the character, which can also be unlocked permanently when receiving them as a gift. So, for instance, if you play as the Pipitrons or Helga, you unlock movies related to their shared backstories, providing more context to the mysteries presented in the main story. Other characters like Spike, the Professor, and Natalie get lighthearted gag sketches. Casey gets a weird music video based on the designer's thinly veiled fetishes. And lastly, my favorite of these are both sets of the monkey intermissions. If you follow this channel, you've probably caught on to this, but one of my favorite aspects that really endears me to a game is things that feel completely unnecessary. However, not in a padding way or something being added to please the lowest common denominator of people. It's the things that feel done out of pure passion, ones that seem as if they're a result of a team who really enjoyed the product they're making. It's not something easy to quantify, but to put it simply, it's when a game has soul. And these intermissions have soul. For the monkeys, instead of doing normal cutscenes, they made live action short sketches about their adventures. There's even outtakes included in the game if you enter the right cheat code, which is a word I haven't said in a long time. Anyway, it's one of the first things I tell people when I talk about loving this game, because at a glance, it might seem random, and it is. But to me, it's so charming and so uniquely Ape Escape. I really can't think of a better single thing in this game that personifies my feelings toward it as a whole. That's what it all comes down to. The art of making a good party game for your series is to make it feel like a party, a celebration for the players who love your games. If it's not clear, I really enjoy everything about this game. There are rough edges here and there, but that doesn't take away from the charm that it just radiates, compared to so many entries in this genre. Even stuff I didn't touch on, like the music. It's always been exceptional in this series and this game is no different. There are songs here that live rent-free in my head to this day, all these years later, whether it be the calm of the menus. The mysterious feeling of the Pipitron theme.
or of course. I'm willing to admit, I still hold a lot of those Barrio Party games in higher regards, to what to play with friends at the end of the day. However, the fact that this doesn't feel like it could belong to any other series is what makes it so special to me. I wish more party game entries felt this exciting as a celebration. I wish we had seen more experiments instead of games that always felt like they were cheaply fitting into preset molds. But that's not what this one did. It was certainly something else. At the end of the day though, what really draws me to this game now of all times to talk about is a lot of what it represents just feels like it's gone away. To some degree, I don't think it'll come back. Party games don't seem to have as much of a place anymore. It's sort of like license games. We don't see them now because they were a cheap genre. With the cost of game development and their waning popularity, there's really no reason to bother. And we miss out on the few gems it would occasionally deliver as a result. This slice of the market does still exist to a degree but it's basically been completely overtaken by stuff like Jackbox. And personally, that's just not something that does it for me. Even the big names still being made doesn't seem to hit the quality it once held in my opinion. A lot of the shakeups introduced over the years have dragged the series down in terms of enjoyment. Not to say they're at the quality of the imitators, but in some ways they feel more phoned in now, even refusing to add simple features like full online play. Then there's Ape Escape itself, the series has been dead for quite a while. We haven't seen a proper mainline game since 2005, and the last game we did get was a shitty PlayStation Move entry in 2010. There were some interesting spin-offs in that time, such as A Million Monkeys, a sequel to this game that meshes the party aspects into the mainline game structure, an idea I found really interesting. And honestly, after playing it, it's right up there with my other favorites. I'd like to talk about it more if the translation ever finishes, but that's part of the point. We didn't get it over here because the series doesn't quite sell in the West. In my personal opinion, that's most likely why we've seen a series decline in general. Ever since the forced Californization of Sony, they've begun focusing on the Western market with their releases. While there were rumors and posts on both the PlayStation and Apescape Twitter accounts, hinting that something was in the works, whether it was another spin-off or finally a return to the main series, we'll never know. As it was all but confirmed to be canned at this point, it seems much like the anime boobs, Sony took Ape Escape out back with a golf club pointed to its head. As much of a downer as that is though, with the current state of Sony, I'm not even sure I'd want them to tackle the series anymore. Maybe it's better to go out with the highs we had if the alternative is a series that no longer resembles what made it great. While I do see mention of the mainline games pop up time to time, I really never see anyone talk about this one. Pumped and Primed and its sequel that made me hack my PS2 with the use of a convoluted method of cutting a hole through a gift card just to play it will always have a special place in my heart. So I hope if you're already a series fan who missed out, maybe you've been convinced to give it a shot. Or perhaps you want to look into the series in general, because that is certainly something I can always recommend. For me though, whether it's by fans finishing translations of the games we missed out on, or just going back to some of my favorite games over and over, Ape Escape, I know we'll, we'll probably, probably meet again, again somewhere. somewhere. So that's the end of the video. Um, if you did like it, you can like it physically, uh, support me here on YouTube by subscribing, all that stuff. Um, this is kind of more the type of video I want to put out, the style of this Amelia Sonic video. And I'm just talking about things I really enjoy that I sometimes feel are going away. So if you like that stuff, there will probably be more, but who knows? But other than that, I do want to try to keep these more brief. So to keep it short, uh, you can, if you want to find me anywhere, you can find links down below to anything. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you in another video.